Welcome to the QFF Business Hour, where we discuss farm business issues. Join us on the last Wednesday of each month at 4 p.m. to engage with industry and professional business advisors to assist you in building your strategic management capacity to prepare for and manage business and climate risks, as well as improve economic, environmental and social resilience. I wish to begin today's episode by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waters throughout Australia and pay respects to elders past, present and future. This session is made possible through the Future Drought Fund Farm Business Resilience Program, a jointly funded program by the Australian Government and the Queensland Drought and Climate Adaptation Program. In this episode, we discuss ways in which to manage weather risk, interpret Bureau of Meteorology data, and look at how power metric, parametric insurance can help prepare your farm for managing severe weather conditions. All right, now I would firstly quickly like to just intro our three panelists. We have Ross Henry, Stakeholder Engagement Manager, Climate Services for Agriculture at the Bureau of Meteorology. Hello, Ross. Looks like we have a bit of an issue there with Ross, but I'll just keep introducing our panellists um, while we sort that one out. Uh, we've got Russell Mehmet, Director of Property and Casualty, WTW. Now, please tell me I have you there, Russell. Yes, you do indeed, Sally. Yes, I'm here. I'm going to introduce Jonathan Barrett, CEO of Celsius Pro Australia Proprietary Limited. Hello, Jonathan. Hi, Sally. Good afternoon. Great to have you on board. I'll keep moving through with our introduction. Undeniably, Australian farmers operate in one of the riskiest and unpredictable environments in the world. And the variability of Australian weather and climate is arguably one of the most difficult risks to navigate and enabling farm businesses to better manage the increasing seasonal variability is absolutely critical to their success. And while Australian farmers have shown incredible resilience, inventiveness and adaptability in the face of climate irregularity, the emergence of climate change is presenting some new challenges. Empowering agribusinesses to make more informed planning and financial decisions on weather and climate, be it short term tactical decisions or more strategic planning for climatic futures is crucial. And today's panellists, well, they're well acquainted with each other, having worked together with the Queensland Farmers Federation on identifying crop insurance as a possible solution to mitigating severe weather risks. I'd like now to bring our first panellist in. Um, we have Ross Henry from, the, from BOM. I'd like to just quickly give everyone a bit of a background on you, Ross, uh, before I throw to the first question. Ross is the Bureau's Stakeholder Engagement Manager for the National Climate Services for Agriculture Project, and he's an agricultural scientist. Ross has been working for over 10 years. He's got a lot of experience providing specialised climate weather risk expertise to industry groups and state and federal governments, delivering numerous significant and innovative projects centred on drought, climate adaptation, risk management, and natural disaster recovery and resilience. Well, we're very happy to have you on board, Ross. Now, my first question to you, I'd really like to talk about, you know, the general challenges of interpreting weather. For instance, I mean, so many of us, we, we plan our day around the weather, don't we? And I know personally, I find it really confusing if I don't know just how much rainfall I'm supposed to expect that day, or is that just me? No, you're 100% right. We do plan yeah. our day around the weather. So it is an integral part of everybody's day, but for agriculture, that's significant. Um, it significantly Very. increases in importance. So it is really important to check frequently, but also understand how to read the, the forecast as well. Um, so depending on where you are, so I'm currently on my phone because I had computer issues. So if you're like me and you're looking at your phone app, Reading yep. the rainfall forecast has recently changed. So mm -hmm. if you are using the Bureau of Meteorology rainfall forecast, hopefully it's nice and understandable now. But um, historically, there has been some confusion. Um, so to clear some of that up and talk about exactly where it is, because it is still available, that forecast on the Bureau of Meteorology website. Yep. Uh, so 
a lot of people, when they read the old forecast, would see a chance of any rain and a percentage following that. So in Queensland, we see big rainfalls typically in summer, and you might get a 90% chance of rain with two figures being, say, 20 mils and 90 mils. What that forecast meant for rainfall is that any rain is 0.2 mils. So you had a 90% chance of receiving any rain, any rain being 0.2 mils. You had a 50% chance of receiving the lower number in the example I've given, that's 20 mils, and a 25% and chance of receiving that higher number. Now, most people, unfortunately, uh, didn't understand that that's what the rainfall forecast was telling them. Uh, okay. On the app now, it's been updated to hopefully simplify that and make it a little bit more easily understandable. Um, and it also gives you extra chance in regards to the confidence of the rainfall we have. So on the app now, if you click on the rainfall, it drops it down for you and it's got a nice explanation there as well. But it will give you a high confidence, so a percentage of 75% chance of a figure of rainfall. So if we wanted to use a, another example, so if we had that same forecast of between 20 and 90, in this instance, the, the low number is the high confidence, so 75%. There would be a middle uh, range of millimetres, which were medium confidence, which is 50%, and then a low one again, say the 90 mils of 25%. So that's made it a little bit easier to understand. It's spelled out a little bit more, and considering how important rainfall is, both in the extremes and the missing out on it, um, it's really nice to be able to kind of access that information and then understand it and interpret it to use in your farm business. That's great. Well, that's fantastic to know that you've um, you've upgraded that too and just, just helping people basically read the rain. Yeah, exactly. Like people mm. do love it. And the, the other mm. little plug that I'll say right now as well is that uh, very recently on the app, you can also see now past information on the app so you can get 72 hours of historical information now presented at your fingertips for your point location so that mm -hmm. near time uh, historical information that is point location specific to you is also another useful management tool particularly in the irrigation or understanding yeah you did get a shower of rain how much was it actually so yeah. another important uh, aspect that's been added uh, along with temperature, mm. historical temperature uh, to, that, to that app. Yeah, well, of course, I can imagine with farmers, they want to know how, exactly how much fell. Yeah, and it's really important mm -hmm. in their decision-making really process. With rain, yes. So with weather being such an integral part of farming, can you outline some of the specific programs that are available to farmers from the Bureau? Absolutely. So mm. I specifically work in a project called Climate Services for Agriculture. Climate Services for uh, Agriculture. Yeah. Climate Services for Agriculture is looking at presenting historical climate information, historical climate information, seasonal information, and climate change information into a, a way that is easily understandable for agriculture. Um, so it's focused at farmers and farmer advisors, and it's a really, really useful tool to understand what's happened historically with your climate, what the season ahead looks like, and what climate change is going to do. The other one that I'll mention um, that most people don't realise is available is uh, the forecasting service called METI. Uh, mm -hmm. So METI is a really important uh, and really valuable forecasting tool on the Bureau of Meteorology that gives you three hourly forecasts out to seven days. Um, and there's some agricultural specific met, um, important metrics within that, uh, frost and wind. Um, mm. So it goes a little bit further than the traditional forecasts that you might see through the radio um, or on your application as well. So C CSA, Climate Services for Agriculture, and METI, I highly recommend people checking those out to get an understanding of what's coming through and being able to be delivered to those uh, people that need it. Um, so as we move into the new season of storms and possible cyclones coming, what's the priority for you right now? The priority for us at the moment is to engage uh, with the agricultural community to make sure they understand what the season ahead holds for them. Um, so 
you know, being able to get out and engage, understand what's required by the agricultural community uh, to inform their decision making um, and really help them understand what's available through the Bureau, uh, Bureau of Meteorology to support that decision making uh, will be a focus for us now. Um, and then once we've got those outlooks delivered as well, we will be promoting those to the communities that are going to need them um, with obviously a particular focus on the potential risks for the season ahead. Yeah. Okay. So it's a bit of a moving feast for you. Always. Yeah, you know, the weather changes every day. So yeah, mm -hmm. we just have to adapt and, and go with it. Yeah. Okay. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Russell um, Mehmet, Director, Property and Casualty WTW. Russell has spent over 35 years in the insurance industry working closely with WTW's London-based alternative risk transfer team. Russell has partnered with University of Southern Queensland, Queensland Farmers Federation, National Farmers Federation and also CSIRO in providing insurance advisory and broking services to several agricultural projects. And we're really happy to have you on board, Russell. Welcome again. Um, first question to you. Um, look, we've seen a decline in available crop insurance. Why is this so? So um, that's been the problem with the Australian crop insurance market that they're really hasn't been a, um, a great, it hasn't been any subsidies from the government, which other countries get. America gets 65% of their farm premium subsidized by the government. So they've had that since the 1930s. Other countries quite similar. We don't have that uh, uh, benefit here in Australia. So it's been a very, very slow process. And most mainstream mm. insurers such as Suncorp and, uh, and WFI, et cetera, usually just provide um, what we call named perils, so some hail and fire cover, but nothing, nothing much beyond that. There's been some attempt at multi-peril crop insurance in years gone by. WFI back in 2017 had a go of it, but, a go at it, but uh, got their fingers burnt and um, decided to pull out of the market a year later. So there was a lot of confidence lost as well. There are a couple of other small pockets, such as Lativo, who have provided some um, income protection cover. But generally, Sally, it's been a pretty, um, you know, pretty lackluster industry for crop insurance. From an insurer's point of view, they see uh, the frequency of extreme weather events, uh, mm. which we, you know, experience in Australia as being a big issue: flood, drought, cyclone. Uh, bushfires that often follow droughts. Um, yeah. They struggle to make any real profit based on that, and mm -hmm. and there there are just a few insurers involved in crop insur in the crop insurance market because they don't see uh, there's there's not a great deal of comp that does means there's not a lot of competition and therefore a, a small premium pool and and they therefore don't find it worthwhile basically. From mm. a farmer's point of view, um, the farmers generally feel it's too expensive, um, which I'm sure a lot of listeners out there would agree with, um, if they were able to buy the cover that is, that the, such as drought and flood. Um, there's no um, consistency from the insurance market, unfortunately. We saw them come in, go out again. The um, climate change situation goes, doesn't give them too much confidence in uh, yeah. In, mm. in providing covers going forward. And um, most farmers don't aren't really aware of any other covers that are available other than those named perils that I just mentioned, such as fire and hail for crop I'm talking about, um, and are not aware of uh, what we call parametric insurance, which is a, a different style of covering, um, covering loss, covering financial loss. Mm. Can we talk a little bit more about the parametric insurance and what type sure. of risks it actually does cover? Yeah, well, Thanks. with traditional insurance, um, Sally, mm. as you'd expect, um, it covers, uh, if there was a loss damage to a property, the assessor would come out, assess the loss, and the payout would be based on the, uh, the amount of damage that has occurred. With parametric insurance, it's more the the probability of the predefined event occurring that's how the premium is based and mm. the payout is then made on that predefined event occurring such as a cyclone occurring within a a certain uh, agreed um, uh, radius from the farm 
if the cyclone occurs, it exceeds, um, say, th category three, then the payout is made. There is no assessment of the loss. The, the figure is agreed before the, when the policy is put in place and the parameters, uh, what's well, called parametric, uh, are agreed and before the policy, if the event occurs, then the payout is made. So much more transparent, um, much more flexibility in the way the farmer gets to decide what amount of premium he wants to pay, um, what his exposures are. It might be rainfall, uh, mm. cyclone, frost, um, hail, any of those uh, measurable type of climatic events can be covered by a parametric policy, far more broader than, mm. uh, than what anywhere that the conventional insurance market is offering today uh, is uh, cover is available with parametric insurance. Mm. Mm. And what industries can benefit? Well, really all industries, all, all primary mm. producers can benefit from parametric insurance. It, really the different type of crop has a bearing on the structuring of the parametric policy. For example, the season that you choose, the period of time, those sort of elements, which I know Jonathan will probably go into in a minute when uh, he talks mm -hmm. about his covers, but uh, they're the, the, the um, areas that have a, the underwriting information that has a bearing on the cover. But the, uh, the, the big attraction is the farmer chooses what limit he wants to purchase. So if he only wants $10,000 cover for oh, a certain amount of rainfall not happening when he really needs it or too much happening at a time when he doesn't need it during harvest, for example, then he only insures the limit and pays the premium that he's um, comfortable with. So mm -hmm. uh, that's where it's very flexible uh, for farmers. And as I say, widely used in many parts of the world, albeit in a lot of in a lot of locations subsidized by government and that's where we've got our challenges but mm. um, it is manageable definitely mm. and how are you finding uh australian farmers responding to it uh slowly if we can say that it's it's mm -hmm. very much an education pro uh, process again that uh, and a trust uh, as well trust, i would imagine trust. Yeah, absolutely correct building up that trust mm. because uh, when I go out and uh, we see farmers, uh, when you mention the word insurance, as many on the line would realise, there's a bit of uh, immediate um, pushback uh, and that lack of uh, confidence and trust. Uh, but if we can build that up in a product that is so simple to operate and really meets needs, um, I think we'll, we'll go a long way to building that trust back up again. Yes, yeah, yeah, which um, is, is very, very important. Well, I might move on to Jonathan now. Uh, and, and we'll come back to you, Russell, uh, shortly. But thank yeah. you very much for um, all the insights there about the param yeah, parametric insurance, because I'm sure for some people listening, they, you know, they really aren't across it at all and not quite familiar with it, quite new to them. Yes, that's that's quite the case. It's, mm. uh, it's a real mm. learning process, takes a bit of time, but um, it's worth it. Yeah. yeah, once you get the grasp the concept, quite simple. Yes, exactly that. And that's the beauty about it is it is quite simplified, it is. isn't it? Absolutely. It's what everyone's used to day to day. Less rainfall, more rainfall, I get paid. That's that's the basic concept. Or yeah. cyclone strikes, I get paid. You know, yes. Rather than all the other complexities that go with uh, assess assessing damage, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Jonathan, I'm going to bring in you now. I'll just um, uh, read your bio just so that everyone has a little bit more understanding of your background. Thanks, Jonathan Barrett, um, well, since 2012, Jonathan's been the CEO of Celsius Pro Australia Proprietary Limited with a focus on agriculture. He's been involved in the financial markets for the last 35 years, having obtained experience in the Australian, London and also Hong Kong markets. And he's proficient knowledge in all aspects of OTC derivatives, foreign exchange, commodity futures and equities markets. And it's just great to have you on board. Let's get going. Um, how can insurance be used as a tool to improve income stability, really important and manage crop losses? Yes, yeah, Sally, look, at, look, it's extremely important. It's also mm. important as we uh, see import prices continue to rise. Um, you know, margins on the land continue to be squeezed. So, so it's more about trying to find products that, uh, that growers can use to, just in case they, they have an issue uh, that is caused by the weather. Um, you know, and, and, and I think when you look at it, and I'll just quickly go back to what Ross was saying about some of their new tools. 
some of the bomb updates um, allowing you to see the rain more regular at your spot just increases the transparency of these parametric type of products. Okay, um, but mm -hmm. uh, and, and that means that um, because it's transparent, we can pay or the reinsurers can actually pay those claims a lot faster. So there's more tech happening, which is enabling these products to uh, become a lot more efficient. But, but back to the questions, mm -hmm. insurance is used to get you back on your feet. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. It, it, it's got to be there to be fit for purpose. Um, it's got to be priced accordingly. Um, you know, a lot of growers will talk to us about the pricing and they were, they're used to paying 3% or 4% for something. Um, and I think one of the, the most, one of the larger ones or one of the, the questions that always come up is why does it cost about 7 to 10%? Um, when you look at it, a lot of farmers will take on, say, a thing like fire and hail covers. They've never made a claim on um, fire in the last 30, 40 years, but they're still paying that 3 to 4% on it. So, mm -hmm. so it's all about, I guess, trying to sort of understand why these things would cost, how they, and why they cost. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that, that's a very important thing because if you have an event, and quite intuitively, if you have an event that happens once every 10 years, from a reinsurance perspective, you'd be prepared to pay 10% for it. Mm -hmm. so, you know, a return of one mm -hmm. in 10 years will cost you 10%. A return of one in 20 years will cost you 5%. And that's very basic how, how we'd operate. But, but as a simple example, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you, if, for instance, you're growing broad acre, you've got about 1,000 hectares, you're growing about two tonne to the hectare and expecting an income of $800,000, you know, you've got a short window of risk that could cost you dearly. And that's mm -hmm. coming up through harvest. And, and, and what we look at it, we look at things like forecasts. And Ross will say, um, you know, from the bomb, and they'll say, hey, this year, it's going to be wet. We've still got La Nina. So that mm -hmm. should send a signal to a lot of growers saying, okay, perhaps this year is the year that I would take out some cover to protect a downgrade. A downgrade in wheat going from an APW down to about a feed will cost you 30%. So if you're expecting a gross of about 800000 then you can really say I've got a potential to lose about $240,000 due to a two- to three-week window where you get excess rain. And, and, and that just means that it might be a scratch year. It might mm -hmm. mean you'll have to work for another year, um, you know, and you can't put that money aside, that profit you've, assi you've assigned. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, very important, I, I think. And, and I think as we, we can see that insurance or derivatives, they can be used to improve income sustainability mm -hmm. and um, stability for the farm. Mm-hmm. So in your in your business, you're doing a lot of listening because you've really got to understand everybody's individual risk, don't you? Oh, absolutely. But but the important thing here is also a lot of risks um, are classified and we, we spend a lot of time um, at working with uh, farmers, trying mm. to really understand their risk. Um, we understand, you know, like, for instance, how wheat behaves to water over harvest. Um, you know, the second day of rain greater than 15 mils you've got a potential for shot and sprung. You know, little bits of increments of rain over the same period, shot and sprung, downgrade. And, and it really is trying to understand where the risk is at the moment. And, and as, an, as an example, this year, although we have traditional harvest downgrade covers that we're doing, um, a lot of farmers are saying that they have a very high moisture so soil moisture content. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that any rain over that harvest will stop the harvester getting in the paddock and will potentially cause their grain to be downgraded. So, so when you look at it, those sorts of things, um, you know, it is, it, it is listening, it's understanding, and it's having the tools to say, let's work, or having the technology to say, what happens if we made it 17 mils? What happens if we made it 20? What does it look like if we combine these covers? You know, a critical day, cumulative, all mm -hmm. these sorts of things we can come up with and come up with a package that fits where the farmer is and how he perceives his risk. Mm, to yeah, to help them best manage it, um, you know, the best possible way. Can you actually explain for us what a weather derivative actually is? So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's basically when you look at a, a derivative, a derivative is just a derivation of something. Um, when you look at, uh, as an example, when um, I guess when people look at the way the oil lords trades and they're, they're, when they're looking at their stock portfolios, there's a measure of, uh, of an index 
okay? And, and the, off that index, we derive a, 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 an option to buy or sell or put or call. I think a lot of people would have an understanding of these mm -hmm. types of financial tools. A derivative is just exactly the same thing. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's a, it's a means for people to be able to pick the risks that they have. We can derive, you know, what, what the cost will be and then also what the payouts will be. But essentially, um, a weather derivative is the same as an insurance. You are buying, you are paying a premium for the right for an event to occur and for you to receive uh, an income from it. Um, the main difference between a weather derivative insurance is that a weather derivative doesn't attract the stamp duties um, and, and other ancillary costs that the insurance does. So in some cases, some people like it, it's a lot cleaner. Um, everyone is bound by promises uh, in a usual way. And if the events occur, well, then the derivative comes to fruition and is paid. So there's no need for proof of loss? There's no need for proof of loss. Um, a classic example would be, you know, if it rained, if you felt that you needed to um, uh, buy a derivative or an insurance product because they can be badged either way. Um, if it's uh, you're looking at your harvest and if you get uh, excess rain per day of 20 mils, you'll get a payout. Mm -hmm. So if Ross's system says it's over 20 mils and Ross or the bomb is the independent arbitrator in all these types of covers, so you have someone that's independent. So if that event actually occurs, it's greater than 20 mils, for instance, then the payout will occur. And everyone's agreed to all the parts of this transaction up front. And when you have uh, the bomb sitting on one side and the bomb says they're the wicket keeper or the, sorry, the umpire, they will say this event occurred, therefore it's paid. Now, even if you didn't get that loss, that material loss, but you paid for the right for that event to occur. And as a result of that, it gets paid. Okay. So when do you take this cover out? Look, what we tend to do is we, we have two types of covers that people look at and they're forecasted mm. and non-forecasted. Okay. Um, you know, and, and generally people will say, well, look, if I'm doing some farm, farm planning, I want to know that I've, I've got some loss underwritten. And we find that when we look at the drought covers, uh, the more longer term types of covers um, where we, we've got an inkling of where things might be going, like the forecast and an example you know, uh, five, we've had five years of drought up in Queensland. Obviously, it's a lot wetter now, but we know drought is going to come back again. So what will happen is if, if the bomb sort of says it's going to be dry and growers want to protect their crop for the full six months to eight months, um, then they'll take a long-term contract and, and that in itself, they'll say, well, well, basically, I can take it for six to eight months. You generally sort of have to have it all organised 20 days prior to the risk period, okay? Wow. So, so that's where you get down to that forecasted side where you can say, well, I think it's going to be dry for the next six months or I think it's going to be wet over harvest, which might be in a couple of months, um, but then I'll, I'll take the cover. But generally the rule of thumb is 20 days prior to the risk period, you have to take the cover and pay for the cover. Okay. And you were saying before there's less red tape, so I imagine this is not a lengthy process, not a not pages and pages and pages. <laughs> no, no uh, it's not. It's not pages and pages. The actual, um, the actual uh, policy, if you want to call it a policy, but that is insurance language. But the the actual terms and conditions are on one sheet. Okay. Wow. And they are promises. It says if this happens, you will get paid. Mm -hmm. Okay, fabulous. Russell, did you want to um, intercept? Have you got anything to add at this stage? Going on John, what Johnson said there, it seems to cover everything off and. Uh... Both, as we were talking about, the derivative, the derivative insurance are very much interchangeable. It's mm. just uh, some companies uh, work in insurance companies work with insurance, some work with derivatives. So, uh, but the advantage, as uh, Jonathan said, is no stamp duty or um, mm. uh, applicable to um, derivatives, which is a, a decent saving until government decides to do something about it. Certainly in Queensland, New South Wales, they've removed it for agriculture, but not in Queensland. What about knows, having worked on it before? <laughs> okay, um, I was just just wondering about the insurable interest. Uh, and a good point, yes, insurable mm. interest uh, with insurance policy. One of the principles I learned right back in my very earliest insurance days was there must be a, to have an insurance policy, policy. There must be an insurable interest to take out that policy. So I couldn't take a policy out on Jonathan's farm 
um, a parametric policy because I don't have an insurable interest in that farm. So that's one of the requirements of an insurance insurance policy. And that's why mortgagees can take them out on properties, et cetera, because they do have an insurable interest. But um, whereas with a derivative, uh, my understanding, Jonathan, is um, it, it's available to anyone who decides to take it out. Yep. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All righty. Thanks. Well, um, I just wanted to bring the conversation back um, to uh, discussing the bomb and bring Ross back into the conversation. I just wanted to know what are your insights um, into how the bomb assists farmers with their risk assessments and how, you know, how they manage future forecasting? Yeah, thank you. So the, the amount of information that, that um, farmers fingertips through the Bureau of, Bureau of Meteorology website is is fantastic. So, you know, you can skim it and get, you know, critical information for your business really simply. Or if you're a data-driven farmer and you want to understand, you know, the trends and that kind of detailed information, you know, the historical information, the seasonal information and the climate projections are all at your fingertips there as well. So depending on the farmer, depending on their, you know, I guess everyone's passionate about the weather if you're in farming, but their, their patience in um, understanding it and going deep, um, all that information is you know, available through the Bureau. Um, and the CSA platform that we're currently developing tries to bring that all to their fingertips, um, all those deep insights to their fingertips and put it in languages uh, that is going to be easy for them to understand and hopefully decision relevant for them as well so they can take that information and start to apply it in their farm business. Mm. So it's just basically, you know, keeping everyone up to date because it changes so regularly. It's It's super important. Yeah, and that's a really good point. It does change regularly. So, mm. you know, predicting the weather, um, predicting the climate, um, particularly in the seasonal sense, you know, it does update when new forecasts are out. So it is important to base your decisions on the latest available information. If you're making decisions from a forecast that you looked at a couple of days ago, you're not making decisions based on the best available information. So it's really important to kind of keep checking, keep up to date with those, uh, with those forecasts, whether they're the normal seven day forecast or the seasonal ones. You know, yeah. make sure that you're making decisions based on the latest information. And so how often would you recommend checking in? <laughs> it's a good question. If you're like me, um, you probably check the app quite a few times and you read every seasonal update that comes out every couple of weeks. Okay. Um, but it is going to be dependent on the farming and their um, their appetite for that type of information. You know, if they've got critical farm practices happening in that day, they might be wanting to check it very regularly. You know, spray drift, wind you know, are big issues for a lot of farmers. So on days that they're doing that, they might want to check it very, very regularly. But on other days when they're just pottering around the farm, it might yeah. be out, more out of interest rather than actually informing a decision on farm. So a really helpful tool, super important. Yeah. Mm. Very much so. And and I, if I if I could just add a little bit, Sally, to that too. Yeah. Um, over the ten years, um, the bomb and uh, parts of the insurance sector have been working very closely together um, to try and deliver the granularity that farmers need to make decisions. And and as Ross correctly pointed out, there's a lot of valuable information that people can use. Um, I've been part of the T Paws project, uh, the trusted private automated weather sites. Um, where we're trying to pick up those uh, sites that the bomb doesn't have to include them in data, to be able to get it, to get the reach to farmers. You know, a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, talk that there is basis risk in a lot of these products, and basis risk to address that is the event that says it's happened, but it's not happened on the farm, right? Uh -huh. uh, but, so it's a very important topic that a lot of people like to discuss. But the work we've done with the bomb. Uh, as enabled and the bombs continuing to work on projects um, where it gives that granularity on a day by day, hour by hourly basis. We've actually had growers that will say, oh, look, how much rain did I get? And I'll say, go to the bomb, have a quick look. You can have a look at your weather station. You can have a look at your grid and it's all ready for you to look at. Then they compare that against their policies they have and they say, oh, it all matches. It's all nice and transparent. So there's a lot of work being done there. Um, and it's really just trying to get the farmers to be able to grab the data and use it because what weather happens on the farm also affects their yield 
So it's important that we can link these types of um, policies, parametric policies uh, to the data that we get from the bottom. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing that we've got so much data, data available to us now. It's just becoming more and more important, isn't it? Oh, look, it's, it, you look at it and, and when we look at the advancements of the technology, um, you know, and, and we're only question it just, just today, um, we only got our iPhones when, what, 2016? It's a smartphone. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, of course, we can't do without it. <laughs> I, and I, I know exactly. And that, yeah, can you imagine? Can you imagine living a life without a phone? <laughs> no, but all, all the tools and the, and the pricing and things like that. It's um, these sorts of things, the smartphones, the technology. It's just enabling us to be able to make our enterprises more sustainable, but we have to use them. You know, um, you know, we, we have to use these things. I sort of amazed at the the weather stations that we can now get on farms and what they can read, the temperatures. So we want to be able to use those that data um, and use it well enough so that we can help that sustainability for a lot of our growers. Yes, and and Ross, I wanted to ask you about the on farm weather sensors and the and the role that they play. Yeah, um, so automatic weather stations, you know, the Bureau has a network across Australia. And as Jonathan just alluded to, we've just gone mm -hmm. through a project uh, called t where we're looking at integrating um, other weather stations from other providers, whether they be private, state government, um, utility-owned weather stations into our uh, network as well, so we can draw on that data. Um, so that came from feedback, not only from the uh, insurance sector, but also the agricultural sector. Um, so we're always looking for that feedback to improve the services and you know, increase our impact and value at the Bureau. Um, so that's one example of that. So, you know, automatic weather stations, you know, you can get really good ones from a farmer point of view to put on your farm for personal interest. If you've got a really good one, then, you know, also reach out because, you know, after a couple of um, text checks and balances and a little bit of historical data, the Bureau can start using that information as well. And, and, and we can start using it as well, mm. which is important too. Exactly. And Ross, something yep. that was mentioned uh, as, as part of that project that uh, Jonathan mentioned is there's a special offer at the moment with BOM, isn't there, leading up to, uh, up to November where any uh, private weather stations can join their um, OBS check, I think is the name of the new facility. Uh, yeah, at no right. cost. So uh, it's a great sort of opportunity for anyone who's got um, automatic weather station capabilities uh, to join up until November for no cost. So it really helps the whole, you know, um, better management of risk. And as Jonathan says, reducing that basis risk, which is what everyone wants to um, wants to get away from. So they get they get covered for what they think they're covered for. Um, well, this, as I was saying before um, to you all, this is cutting edge technology here, isn't it? It's like basically a new yes. direction in insurance, is it not? Oh, oh, Very much. Yeah. I look, so I, I get amazed. Uh, there's a project that we're we're working on with uh, QFF at the moment. Um, we're in the um, horticultural sensor area where we're working with hail plates, um, mm -hmm. hail sensors. So the sensor actually sits uh, in the paddock of risk. And it senses the size of the hail, uh, the velocity of the hail, and then we have a parametric payout that's attached to it. So it's, uh, uh, I think Russ and myself and, um, and um, the QFF have been up in Pineapple Land in Queensland uh, doing a lot of learning uh, about how we can help to de-risk that, that industry. Um, yeah. And as you said earlier, it is all about just... Uh, just a little bit of shoe leather and just keeping those ears open and listening. But I love where the technology is going. Mm, mm. So uh, I think you mentioned to me a little while ago when we were discussing this um, with the um, pineapple farmers, you know, what, what could, what's potentially could go wrong in, in a very short period of time for them? Well, look, I think that's a, what's one of the interesting, mm. um, I guess, applications of technology because when you look at... Um, the rotations of the farm, you know, they've got uh, three to four months of exposure to hail and therefore they could lose about, um, you know, probably about 60 to 50, 50 to 60 percent of their uh, annual income just through to a hailstorm that might last for a couple of a uh, couple of um, or, or 15 to 20 minutes. You get some large stone there and it's sort of gone. And there are ca examples of cash flow crisis which have occurred. Uh, mm -hmm. just because they've had that hail. So it is all about that de-risking. It's using the technology, coming up with something that is sustainable for the growers. 
Absolutely. Um, now, have we got anyone else want to add into that? Because there are any other examples that you can uh, share with our listeners today of just how successful it is to, to get on board with a parametric insurance? Russell, or we got you there? Yeah, yeah, still here. I'm just thinking of a specific example that the uh, the new uh, bomb weather capabilities will really add to was uh, a couple of years ago being out of the farm out at uh, Cecil Plains and a sizable uh, wheat farmer there said, look, I used to take out parametric insurance, but when I uh, submitted a claim for a, a rainfall event, with, I forget whether it was drought or flood, I think it was insufficient rain, when the reading came back from Dolby, uh, which is a reasonable enough distance away, it didn't match up with the reading he had on his um, reading on his farm. So he wasn't able to be paid. The payment must be based on what the reading is from the bomb nearest bomb weather station. So by broadening out that capability that uh, that bomb is now providing, there's an example of quite likely that claim payment would have been made because it would have been read um, if his if his location his reading was on his station, which he did have an automatic reader, and bomb had accepted it, then that claim would have been paid out. So. As Jonathan and Ross suggested, the, uh, the, the science is making all the difference and the, the broader that um, spread can be, the, more, um, the better it's going to be for farmers to get the outcome they really deserve. Yeah. I mean, just to, to add a little bit about there, uh, a lot of our growers, um, a lot of growers love checking the weather every day. Uh, the BOM put out a, a fantastic website uh, which, which just sort of gives you uh, the way the rain forms over their properties. And you actually see it and they just check it and they say, oh, I've had 22 mils, it's a power. And then they log on to our systems and they say, oh, it's 22.3 mils, oh, it's a power. And it's all automated. And, and, mm -hmm. and this to me is, 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 is just great because you can, you can check the soil moisture, you can check how much rain, the temperatures, and all this enables us to be, to be better farmers, better providers of services, uh, the whole lot. So... Uh, yeah, no, I'm very, very excited by the future and also what Ross and the BOM are providing. And as you were yeah. saying, it's very broad too, so it's catering to a lot of different farming areas and businesses, which is important. All around Australia now, that's completely mapped. Mm. You've got grid data that covers everywhere in Australia, so, you know, quotes and things can be easily done within five minutes. And I think also, you know, a, you know, a beef farmer in, in one state might have, a, you know, obviously very different down in Tassie. So there's a difference there. So they're going to need to, you need to cater for that as well. Absolutely. And it's also important that the insurance um, market can, it, it's sort of a chicken and egg situation. You want to have as many covers as possible because that reduces the risk for the liquidity providers, the insurance providers. Um, but you also want the many farmers to be able to take it up because that helps them as well. So so the more you can get this interaction happening, uh, the more covers, you'll only find that premiums will go lower uh, because more people are there and the reinsurers don't have to factor in additional risk premiums. Yeah, and the, and the weather is becoming I'll, more I'll just more. add to that, Jonathan. I'll mm. just, yeah, so it also can, you know, parametric insurance can also take into account that farm businesses' risk appetite. Um, and also their, their ability to manage risk as well. So you could have two farmers in neighbouring places that would take out different covers based on their ability to manage that risk as well. So it is really nuanced in that way as well, So which is a fantastic opportunity that rewards good farming practice and rewards good Brazilian businesses as well. I 100% agree with that. We get a farm that has a soil moisture at one level and the other farmer across the road has another and they'll take different covers. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yes, that opportunity to align the risk management work that the farmer already knows from you know centuries or whatever of, of, of best management practices with uh, parametric products to pick up the extreme event that, that really uh, keeps them awake at night, if you want to think about it that way, mm. aligning the two, yep. Mm. And that's the thing too, isn't it, Russell? We, you know, it's what keeps you awake at night that's... Yes. Yeah, that's yeah, very exactly. draining, very taxing. Mm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we wouldn't, um, you know, not insure our own home just in case that massive cyclone comes or uh, the fire happens. We probably know it probably won't happen, but we wouldn't mm. want to take the risk of, of not having that cover there. So that same sort of thinking um, 
but the way the insurance market's set up at the moment, um, it's just not not catering for for crop insurance well enough. Whereas parametric insurance gives you that um, that versatility to get the cover that you need. Yes, and we you know we don't hesitate reinsuring our car, but we we no. think twice about insuring our you know income. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a livelihood in this case. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'd ever go out and have, you know, a uh, million dollars out in the paddock and not insure that income. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I've got two weeks of risk when it potentially is going to harvest. It just, it just doesn't make sense not to do it. Um, but, mm. but that's life. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know the old-fashioned way maybe is to. Um, oh look, I'll just put a, a lot of money away and I'll invest it. Yes. And that'll be my backup for. If, if it happens. But, you know, I guess the question is, do you really put it away and can you trust yeah. that? <laughs> Not everyone can do that. <laughs> no. That's right. yeah. No, that's, that's, that's exactly right. And not everyone, even if they can, does it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it takes a lot of discipline. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and this is the good thing about it. It's done. And yep. you know, and then you can rest assured that you're, you're covered when that, if that, if that event happens. And I think that's key to this, isn't it? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it. I think the bottom line, what's coming to mind here for me, is um, preparedness. It's just yes. being ready, just in case. Is that right? Absolutely. Right. That's it. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, you can you can forecast these things to a certain degree. I often talk to to growers and say, the bomb says it's going to be wet. Well, doesn't it mean you should take something? The bomb says mm -hmm. it's going to be dry. Doesn't it make sense to underwrite something? You mm -hmm. know, underwrite some of your risk and. Uh, you know, even if it's something, it doesn't matter. But you know, if you can recoup your premium out of the covers with a little bit extra, well, then you are in front. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you know what? We're nearly at the hour. Can you believe that? It goes so quickly. Mm. Um, but before I let you, both, you all go, um, I really want um, to ask you one little question. I'd like you to share with our listeners either some words of wisdom or a top tip that, um, that will be helpful for them. Okay, so I'm going to start with you, Ross. Uh, my top tip is to arm yourself with the best information available. Um, and, you know, the Bureau of Meteorology can give you a hell of a lot of climate and weather information to inform your decision making. Um, and I highly recommend that everybody goes on and checks out the Climate Services for Agriculture project uh, and has a look at the tool that we're developing there. Okay. And then, to, you know, to check it, what, monthly? Check yes. in monthly? Yes, absolutely. Mm. Yep. So it's got commodity specific indices there that are going to be relevant to that period of time. Um, mm. It's got obviously climate, historical climate information that's going to continue to update. And then it's got that seasonal information that can really help with your planning over the short term in regards to like one month to three months as well. So mm. it's designed for farmers to help them inform their decision making on farms. So you know, it's a really valuable tool and also it's still in development. So it's valuable for us, for people to have a look at it, tell us what they like and don't like, so we can make sure that it really fits that need uh, and services the agricultural community as it should. And so you welcome the feedback? Oh, 100%, yes. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Thanks, Ross. Ross. Yeah, and Russell? Hi, Charlie, I've been thinking about it while you've been talking there. Uh, probably something like I said before, consider um, parametric insurance for that extreme weather event that keeps you awake at night. Yeah. Um, just, just think about aligning it with what risk management uh, process uh, pr practices that you have mm -hmm. on farm at the moment. And then the, one, the, the extreme event that really leaves you worried, think about some form of parametric insurance uh, to, to give you that little bit of uh, comfort. Yeah, and I guess as, as the policies are changing and you're constantly updating them too, is just to make sure you check in and, you know, if you take yes. it out for a certain period of time, that might need to be adjusted in another eight that's, months. Or that's months. right, yes, yes. And, uh, yeah, to be staying in touch and keeping across it and uh, it mm -hmm. can be adjusted. The good thing about it, I must say, and Jonathan probably agrees, that parametric insurers don't seem to be too uh, flustered, deck too flustered by the uh, climate change situation. They're pretty consistent with their pricing. Touchwood stays that way, unlike the general insurance market that uh, have extreme fluctuations, as we all know, with their pricing for um, various risks. So we think parametrics is fairly consistent because it's based on historical events over a long 100 years, basically. Yeah, historical data. We love it. Historical data, yep, can't beat it. 
Yep. No, can't beat that. And Jonathan. No. Oh, look, Sally, I, I think the, the in our space, um, you know, we, we sit between the reinsurers and the growers and it's our experience. It's In my mind, it's just all about having a conversation, um, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of like, um, you know, calling up saying this is my risk. Oh, I've, I've had a look at that one. I understand where you're coming from. Um, and having that conversation so we can use our experience to try and um, get a, a cover that's fit for purpose for the risk that the grower has. I mean, we've done a, a just recently a lot of work on the cyclone um, covers, parametric cyclones. And um, and and it, it's interesting that it doesn't matter what industry you're talking to, and this is more on the horticultural side, you know, cyclones, when they come through, are absolutely devastating. But we spend a lot of time talking to uh, particular growers, in this case, is bananas and mangoes. And mm -hmm. uh, you can come up with covers that say, oh, hey, that's affordable. Yes, I like that. But, but, but the important thing that I would say, Sally, is, let everyone just have a conversation um, about your risks and your worries. As Russ said, you know, go to bed with a with, a, with, a, with good dreams rather than worrying. Um, yeah. And for these sorts of things, you can cover it. But just have that conversation so we can learn and then we can hopefully provide you with the right cover that allows you to sleep at night. And if you can sleep at night, you've got a clearer mind. So you're going to be a lot more productive in your day-to-day -day work as well, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely. But there also there's studies which have been done that actually say that if you you do take insurances that uh, your work practices pick up and your potential for yield picks up as well because you're happy to take a little bit more risk and in the good years you're making a little bit more. Yeah, fabulous. Oh, that's a great way to wrap up. Well, thank you all for joining us today. It's been very, very informative. Um, I think because we've... Um, because we've been sort of discussing it so deeply, um, I think we might have answered everyone's questions because I don't seem to have any there. Um, but if anyone does have a question for any of our panellists, please do shoot them through and um, they can get back to you um, individually and address those. So I'd like to thank very much again, Ross Henry, Stakeholder Engagement Manager, Manager Climate Services for Agriculture Bureau of, of Meteorology. It's so lovely to have you on board. Thank, thank <laughs> you for having me. It's been great to have you on board. and. Russell Mehmet, Director, Property uh, Casualty, WTW. Russell, it's been great to have you with us as well. It's a pleasure. And, Thank you, Sally. And yeah. Jonathan Barrett, CEO, Celsius Pro Australia Proprietary Limited. Thanks for having me, um, that's it's been great and very informative and um and i'd just like to say to everybody tuning in too thank you for joining us it's been great to have you on board just a reminder that our next webinar or discussion as we like to call it really because we like to keep it casual is on wednesday the 28th of september at 4 p.m and we'll be talking with cotton australia and their producers about how they're managing their property risks and planning to improve their farm business and we'd also like to invite you to the Workforce Planning Connect Tools for Agricultural Business webinar, which is on the Thursday, the 22nd of September. Um, it's from 10 a.m. and it goes for two hours, so ends at about 12 o'clock. And it's hosted by the Queensland Farmers Federation and Jobs Queensland. The two-hour webinar will demonstrate how to develop your own workforce plan as well as discuss the benefits of undertaking workforce planning so that would be a great one to to join you're all more than welcome to register i'm sally williams thank you again for your attendance today and i look forward to seeing you in our next uff business hour take care <music>